Dear friends, uh, I am now well into my final year as chair of the IASB. And you can tell it's the end of my tenure because I no longer get invited to give the opening speech, but rather the closing one. <laughs> Joking aside, the good news is that I am planning to leave peacefully. There will be no armed insurrection, no ma mobs of angry national standard setters incited to overwhelm the ISB's offices in Canary Wharf. Of course, there would be little point in that because the office has been closed for months due to the pandemic. So, unlike a former president, I have already called my successor, Andreas Barkov, who we all know so well, to congratulate him as the new chair of the ISB. And as the former chair of the German standard setter, Andreas very much understands what national standards, standard setters need from the ISB. So really, now you have somebody on the inside. The last 10 years have really flown by. The IFRS Foundation and I took a great gamble when I became chair of the IESB. Given that I had little uh, experience with accounting and that most technical accounting issues were absolute abacadabra for me. For me, at least, it was a gamble that paid off. I thoroughly enjoyed my adventures in the world of accounting, and I have not regretted my decision for one single minute. As you know, my background was first in politics and then as chair of the Dutch securities regulator. And during the financial crisis, the accounting for financial instruments came under attack. Some banks and their supervisors were pointing the finger at accounting when the blame was really much closer to home. And in my role as securities regulator, it was clear to me that the main problem was in the prudential standards which had allowed bank capital to be hollowed out over the years. And I felt that the criticism of accounting was a typical case of shooting the messenger, so I gave a speech defending IFRS standards and warning of the dangers of rash proposals to suspend all fair value accounting. My speech came to the uh, attention of the IASB and the rest is history. The moral of the story, of course, is be very careful what you say in speeches. Looking back on the last 10 years, I am truly proud of what the ISB has achieved. Together, we completed reforms following the global financial crisis. We delivered major improvements to financial instruments accounting, to revenue recognition and to lease accounting, often in the face of fierce uh, lobbying. And of course, I should not forget IFRS 17, which greatly improves accounting for the very important insurance industry. Many gaps and weaknesses in recognition and measurement have been addressed. And the updated conceptual framework for financial reporting gives a more solid foundation for our standard setting activities. In my second term, we have focused more on delivering improvements to presentation. And we have made progress at making disclosures more relevant and not just a data dump. And we have improved our taxonomy, which is so important for the electronic consumption of financial information. The primary financial statements project is not yet done, but I'm convinced it will greatly improve the structure of the income statement which again is very important given the growing practice of electronic consumption of financial information. The project will also greatly improve transparency and discipline around the use of non-GAAP measures. The upcoming update of the management commentary practice statement will help companies provide better information on their value drivers that escape the financial statements, such as a business model, strategy, intangibles, and sustainability issues. We have also worked together to ensure our standards are implemented in full in many parts of the world. And when the United States got cold feet about the adoption of IFRS standards in 2011, many predicted that the world of IFRS would fall apart. 
And I am proud that the adoption of our standards around the world has continued apace, especially among the booming economies of Asia. More than 140 countries have adopted IFRS standards and more are knocking at the door. In the meantime, many prejudices around IFRS, its purported obsession with the balance sheet and fair value accounting and the perception that application is far from consistent, all those um, prejudices have largely been laid to rest. We could not, of course, have done the job without you as national standard setters, many of whom have become personal friends. IFAS is a wonderful example of what can be achieved when highly skilled people from around the world work together to solve common challenges. And this is even more impressive given the anti-globalization backdrop of the last five years. Promoting and protecting this global endeavor has been one of my main tasks. As a former politician, I have done my best to keep politics at bay and to keep accounting as political, as apolitical as uh, possible. After all, it takes a thief to catch a thief. The IFRS model of global cooperation is built on independent standard setting, but we have to earn and maintain the right to that independence. Otherwise, we risk losing it. And that means being in tune uh, to the economic and political environment and being absolutely devoted to quality and to our rigorous due process. But in the end, it is about trying to find the right accounting solution rather than the politically expedient one. It means we need to work hard to bring people along with us, explaining time and time again the importance of what we do and the rationale for the decisions that we take. I think we have been largely successful in this balancing act, but I have to admit that IFRS 17 is still subject to controversy. The good news is that everybody wants the standard to be effective in 2023. But some still plead for a European adaptation to the insurance standard to limit the scope of the annual cohorts requirement. When push comes to shove, <clears throat> I hope they will ask themselves, is it really worth it? Will European insurers really look good if they apply a carve out that most investors will view as a shortcut that distorts performance? Is it in the industry industry's interest to lose the full benefits of applying the same standard across the world. I took office in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008, and I must admit that the perilous state of the global economy now makes me even feel more worried than I was 10 years ago. Money has never been cheaper. We live in a bizarre world where investors pay to lend their money to governments. Governments are often in deep financial trouble. Junk bonds carry very low yields that were once reserved for AAA rated companies. As a result, debt has exploded around the world. The latest figures show a worldwide total debt to uh, GDP ratio of over 355% and growing. At the same time, free money has driven asset prices through the roof. In the midst of the severe COVID recession, the most severe recession in the post-war period, we see and, 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 and the accompanying rising unemployment. We still see stock prices and house prices breaking record after record. The global economy is totally distorted, and I suspect many a central banker wakes up in a cold sweat at night thinking about all the risks that lurk in plain sight. No one really knows exactly how this will end, but it, I doubt it will be pretty. And when the economic stress that has been building up finally erupts, do not be surprised if accounting will come under pressure again, just it as it did in 2008. But that is exactly the point when proper accounting matters the most. It is in a crisis when you can see who is swimming naked. And it is the job of accounting to tell the naked truth, no matter how unappealing this nudity might be. 
So accounting has never been more important and neither has the role of IFAS members. And my ask for you to, is to give Andreas and his team the same support that you have given me uh, in the last decade and which I really appreciate it. I leave with fond memories of our times together and I wish you all the best. COVID has limited the opportunity for me to say goodbye in person, but I hope our paths will cross at some point in the future. Thank you so much for your kind attention.